So welcome back for our last panel of the day and the last panel of the body-based triad, uh, type one. Um, type one, uh, type ones are sometimes called the perfectionist or the reformer. Um, this is a, a personality type uh, who is very focused on making things better. On uh, they ha when they pay attention, and remember where your attention goes is a big part of what defines the Enneagram type. Ones pay attention to the difference between how something actually is and its distance between where it is and how it and and perfection, <laughs> and the ideal. Uh, so they're looking they're looking at things in terms of right and wrong, in terms of good and bad, in terms of how something is and how could how it could be improved or perfected. Uh, and they look at themselves in this way, and they look in the, at the world in this way, and others to some degree. Um, so ones are body-based types. Sometimes ones um, look like head types because they can be very intellectual. Uh, but as Helen Palmer once said, I thought in a beautiful way, uh, the energy of, of one, it, they're body-based types. It comes up from the gut, and it kind of gets stopped by the head. Uh, it gets judged by the head. <laughs> Is that the right thing to do? Um, wait a minute, are you sure you want to do that again? Um, ones can be quite self-critical. Um, in childhood, usually the pattern was that they were criticized. They, they felt criticized uh, from the outside world, usually parents and caretakers, and that was painful. And so as a coping strategy, they kind of take in the critical voice and monitor themselves proactively to do the right thing or to be a good boy or girl um, so that they don't get criticized as much or any longer. Um, now, and so they sort of, again, we all do to ourselves what was done to us to a degree. And so um, with the three subtypes, there is a varying degree of self-criticism versus criti criticism of other. Um, Self-preservation uh, ones are the true perfectionist. Um, they are more critical of themselves and less critical of others. The, the one-to-one -one or sexual one is more critical of others and less critical of self, although can still be critical of self. And the social is kind of in the middle. Social is kind of a mixed, a mixed bag. Um, can be somewhat self-critical and also critical of others. Um, the, we talked about anger with the other body types. And uh, once again, this type is a type that is the character structure is in some ways shaped by their experience and their relationship to anger. Um, whereas eights tend to overdo anger and, and nines underdo anger, uh, ones are kind of in the middle. Most, a lot of ones, especially naive ones who, who haven't worked with the Enneagram, you ask them if they are angry, they usually say, no, I don't get angry very much or I'm not that angry. Uh, but what happens, but they do often relate to feeling uh, more repressed versions of anger, like, uh, like irritation or annoyance uh, It can leak. So again, remember when we don't fully, we aren't fully conscious of a feeling, it doesn't disappear. It sort of leaks out in other forms. Um, and whereas for nines, um, when, they, when they suppress or go to sleep to their anger, it leaks out as passive aggressive behaviors like saying yes and then not doing it or, um, or um, passive resistance, stubbornness. Um, for uh, ones, it leaks out as a kind of resentment that other people aren't working as hard to get things right as they are. Other people maybe aren't following the rules like they are. Um, other people are doing some things that aren't so good for the environment or the people around them, and that doesn't feel so good. So it's an it's a irritation or a dissatisfaction that comes from things not being right. Uh, and, and, and so that, that there can be a sort of a repressed version of anger. Um, there are two ones that repress anger. The, the self-preservation one represses it the most such that the heat of anger gets transformed into warmth. Um, so they can be very warm and friendly, but inside very critical and hard on themselves. Um, socials repress it, repress it halfway so they can be cool, uh, very intellectual type. 
Um, and sexual ones tend to be the angriest one in, the, in this approach to the subtypes. Uh, a lot of sexual ones will say it's okay to be angry, whereas self-preservation ones will often feel like it's not okay to be angry. You really need to put a lid on that. Um, and so again, many ones won't relate to being angry, but of course the path of growth for ones is to be just more aware of what kinds of things make them angry, um, how they are when they're angry. Um, sometimes ones don't realize uh, that other people feel criticized by them because for a one, ones will feel like I'm just trying to help you. Uh, but other people will feel like what they're saying feels critical. And so that can be a blind spot for ones as well. Um, but overall, ones are among probably the most well-intentioned uh, types out there, the people who are trying the hardest to do things well and follow the rules for the most part um, and uh, can be very hard on themselves uh, and uh, can suffer a bit in that they often feel like they have to suppress or repress their instincts and impulses and feelings to do it the right way, uh, to be good. Um, and from a psychological point of view, one of the things when I started putting together sort of uh, early developmental psychology ideas with the Enneagram, um, it, it was interesting to me that Naranjo says that, that ones are the prototype for all of us and of being anti-instinctual. Uh, and sort of like holding in the, your instincts and your impulses. Like it's not okay to just do whatever you want. Um, it may not be okay to, to, to have certain impulses in certain situations. Um, and so because of this, um, part of the rule following, part of the, the wanting order and structure in the world comes about by trying to kind of find their own rhythm. Sometimes ones were forced to be on other people's rhythm, the kind of idea that you have to do it right, you have to do it this way, you have to do it according to this timing. Um, and they were sort of, they sort of, again, because their coping strategy was to try to do it right according to the messages they got, um, to right, almost conform to an outside, the outside world's uh, rhythm. Uh, they also will talk about how they have, uh, uh, they feel things very kinesthetically. They sort of know when something feels right or perfect. Uh, and so part of the growth is to uh, find their own rhythm. And sometimes as children, they weren't allowed to just have their own rhythm and find that in a natural way according to their own timing. The, the, the example Naranjo uses is that archetypally, it's the child who was forced to be potty trained before he was ready. Um, so it's like, you have to do this because uh, your parent is telling you you have to poop. I mean, something as natural as that, uh, instead of just allowing it to happen according to, you know, all kids have their own, you know, timetable and kind of having the, that be attuned to by the outside world, um, they sort of have to, they've learned that they need to almost con over control uh, even their physical uh, expression and, uh, and be over responsible. Uh, to others and to the to the world, um, so that's a bit of an introduction to uh, the one personality, and we have three very experienced uh, type ones here. So I really want to appreciate Bill, and Dale, and Newt um, for being here. Dale and Newt are old time friends of mine from the Enneagram community, and Bill is a new friend, um, but uh, uh, someone who also has a lot of experience with uh, working with his type and with the Enneagram. So thank you all for being here today and for doing this for us. So first, I just have been asking people just to talk a little bit about how you found your type in the Enneagram and how you see some of the basic one patterns playing out in your life. How, what, what do you see when you self-observe your, your personality in action? Uh, yes. Um, the, uh, I've been in a men's group for about 22, 25 years, something like that. And one of the exercises we did was going around the group in a truth-telling circle. And uh, I think the topic of criticism came up in some sort of uh, realm. And they you know, they said, oh, yeah, well, you're very critical. I said, I'm not critical. You know, I, I, not me. <laughs> I'm not critical. And so anyway, then I started uh, investigating the Enneagram because one of the leaders of the group said, read Helen's book. And so I was off and running on the Enneagram. And uh, I still, I looked at this and I thought, you know, that's that's not me. I want to be anything but a one. I don't want to be a judge. I don't want to be critical. I don't want to be hyper. And of course, 
<laughs> that should have been the clue. And the, the, uh, then I attended a number of panels, and the panels for me were the clincher because when I heard, you know, my words coming out of their mouths, I thought, all right, I get it. You know, I'm a one. I'll accept that. Um, and uh, at the time, I was in a relationship with uh, a woman who also was a one. And so that made that relationship very interesting. Because, <laughs> uh, uh, we, and, and one thing about ones, we know it's right, but each of us have our own version of right. <laughs> Sometimes it's a different version. <laughs> yes. That's right. That's correct. But um, so initially the, the uh, awareness came through a combination of uh, truth-telling um, uh, panel and relationship. That's great. Yeah. I'm going to speak about uh, how I came to the Enneagram a little bio biographically. Mm -hmm. um, I'm from a large family. I'm one of uh, eight sibs with two parents. I was raised by a double six couple. My dad was a very unhealthy six, spent his whole life at his three, and my mother was a pretty healthy nine, six who spent her life at her nine. Um, uh, I was my father's scapegoat which uh, it, to translate into Enneagram language made me a candidate to be a one. Uh, there's a brilliant Jungian analyst named Sylvia Pereira who wrote a book called The Scapegoat Complex. Mm -hmm. And she has a line in that book in which she said, the scapegoating parent was seen by the child in a way the parent knew he was finally seen and he would do everything to make sure the child suffered to the same degree that being seen affected him. Wow. So that was how I developed my early strategy, which uh, I didn't, of course, know the Enneagram in 1948 when I was developing this <laughs> characteristic in my dad's life. Um, I grew up and I entered a religious life to study to be a Roman Catholic priest. And I spent 10 years as a Jesuit and ended up in Berkeley, California in the late 70s, where the Enneagram had one of its original nascences was in Berkeley. And there was a uh, Jesuit named Bob Oaks, who was taught by Nerano and others. Mm -hmm. And he taught my spiritual director, the Enneagram. So I was wow. informed of the Enneagram in 1978 as a tool in spiritual direction. And my spiritual director <laughs> typed me as a six mm -hmm. because I lived with enormous amount of existential fear. Mm -hmm. But during our year of uh, spiritual direction, uh, two enormous life events occurred for me. Um, I quit drinking. I, was, uh, I drank alcoholically. I quit drinking in September of 1978. And on October 4th, I came out of the closet. So I blew my life open. Mm -hmm. A week later, my spiritual director, having this new experience of Bill's energy, said, oh, girl, you are not a six. You are, <laughs> you are a one. I go, give me the book. So I read the book. <laughs> And I really took, I was so happy to be a one <laughs> because I was finally in touch with my oneness, which was my true path. Mm -hmm. Not that it's not a complicated path. It's a complicated path. Mm -hmm. um, I just retired as a psychotherapist after a practice of close to 40 years. And I use the Enneagram a lot in my practice. And I teach the Enneagram as a spiritual discipline uh, at Bishop's Ranch in Healdsburg. Some of you may know about Bishop's Ranch. Um, I love the Enneagram. I've used it in my personal life, in my professional life, in my social life. I'm a, uh, a, se a sexual one. Um, I'm married to a nine uh, who wanted nothing to do with the Enneagram for the first 10 years of our marriage, <laughs> which I took great umbrage about. And I, of course, I typed him as a six because he was so filled with fear of the Enneagram mm -hmm. until one day he took Riso and Hudson's book from my library and he surreptitiously read it and he said at dinner one and I goes and I'm a nine I go okay then so uh, that's kind of my introduction to the Enneagram I work with it kind of daily but not at the conscious level I don't have my I don't read read the books anymore I've, I've integrated a lot but I'm so aware of my life issues that come out of this typology and I am enormously grateful for the Enneagram uh, it's had a, a very large impact on my life and on the life of everyone in my life to 
their delight or scorn, depending. <laughs> Amen to that. Well, for me, uh, it was very easy for me to identify my Enneagram type. Um, I'd been pointed at Alan Palmer's first book and classes and so on. Um, and I got a, a push from my therapist to go uh, attend a class like this. And so typical fashion for me, I got the book and started reading before the class. Like, I better study this, you know, figure out what's going on. And when I came to the chapter on one, it was clear to me for two reasons. One is what be said, there's a sense in there that describes to me how my mind works that had never occurred to me before, that I see things in the world, what stands out is things that are wrong or out of place or somehow off against a background perception of how things could be perfect or beautiful. And it's like, that's how my mind works. That's how I see things. That's just like how information comes to me. It automatically picks up what's off here. You know, it's like, it's not anything I have to try for. It's just like, just like seeing and hearing. It's just a sense that how it works. It's like, that's me. And the other thing in there was, I read how it's an anger type. It's like, I don't see that. But then the fixation in the system is resentment. It's like, ah, I know resentment. <laughs> this is a frequent visitor. All kinds of things in the world can bring up resentment for me. It's like, this is one of my big things is resentment. And I, I knew that in myself. You know, I, I, res I resent all kinds of things. And Could you give us a few examples often. of what might bring up resentment for you? Um, well... Endless, but you know, <laughs> just a few. <laughs> um, you know, if if I'm driving and somebody does something unpleasant, you know, then resentment would be the normal deal. Um, and if somebody's not working as hard as I am, or doesn't do as good a job as I am, or or they're taking off and having fun and I'm still working, you're like oh, big resentment. Mm -hmm. And uh, it after I I went to an Enneagram class like this and it was amazing. And uh, most of my life I'd been interested in psychology and spiritual studies and never found anything that really got me very far anywhere. But this system gave me traction and way into like how to study myself and find out how do I work. Uh, it gave me enough you know, a, a good start on this and that, that I finally had something really appropriate to me to look at and to, you know, to study and to learn about. Uh, so that was great. Uh, and it's, I, I threw myself into studying Enneagram and with great teachers and great friends. And it, it took me a year of looking at myself really carefully and finally, I could see I'm angry. Mm -hmm. It took me a whole year before I could see that. Mm -hmm. Before that, it's just like what I knew was I was tense. I was uptight. I was tight. It's like <coughs> all the time. That's my normal thing. And in terms of the energy and the knowledge, it's like my... The way I learn and the way I get energy comes from my gut, my body. But I tighten up just by living in the world. I tighten up about everything. And the energy all ends up in my head. Uh, and I don't, until that time, I really didn't have much of a sense of my body, my sensations, my emotions. They were all pretty repressed. Uh, which my childhood, my father was a very stern, strict Enneagram One. 
And he was similarly repressed and couldn't stand anger or emotions in the house or anything like that. So as a child, I learned to squash all of that stuff and just try to be rational and obey the rules and so on. So. Great. Thank you. Newt, do you want to say anything more about... I, I, I was going to say... Mm -hmm. oh, Anything you, more you want to say about um, self-criticism, let's say? Um, for me, the self-criticism, well, I have to criticize that statement. <laughs> it's uh, uh, it's just the way my mind works, you know. It's like, Before it even came all the way out. <laughs> that's right, you know. It's like, that's not exactly right for me. It's like a little bit off. So... <laughs> For me, it's like, if you think of growing up as a kid, my father is this critical person, and he's the important person in my life. I want his love. I want his affection. I want him to like me. And so what I learned to do was preemptively examine what I was doing, how I was acting, and to to conform to what's needed, what's the right way, what are the rules, you know, just to not do something wrong and criticize myself, but to be aware of, like, that would be wrong, that would be off track, and then to not go that way, to go the right way. So it's like almost a sense of that's danger, that's not a good way, mm -hmm. you know, so it's kind of... Uh, it's built in. There's a built-in thing that helps me avoid mistakes, mm -hmm. as opposed to and trying to avoid being wrong and then getting criticized and then that hurt, right? So, mm -hmm. so it sounds like a lot of the tension comes from bracing against both impulses, but doing it wrong or making a mistake or like really con controlling yourself. Right. The tension, I agree, is is the impulse to actually just kind of do what you feel like doing is really dangerous mm -hmm. because particularly in my childhood household, my father was not going to, was almost certainly to go off. This would be, he'd be really angry at mm -hmm. any kind of impulsive behavior. So all that gets bottled up and changed into a different form of energy. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Newt, do you want to say anything more about anger or self-criticism or no i'm enjoying this this is really great to be <laughs> among among folks who understand me i mean that, that that really is nice and and that's been part of the the journey all along uh self-criticism big time i'll just give you a very quick synopsis my father was born in 1879 a pioneer and the old school way he was 60 years old 63 when i was born and uh, spare the rod and spoil the child. It was the old way of disciplining children. And so I got a lot of rod and would only I learned fairly quickly that I was going to have to obey and do the right thing or I was going to get beaten. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, my mother, he was a type one. My mother was also a one, German. And uh, she, um, however, decided to take over the leather uh, razor strap and use a brush because it didn't do as much damage. But anyway, I was beaten a lot when I was growing up. But I avoided that by being a good boy. I had to be a good boy. And so being a good boy has been the model of my life. And the inner critic that is constantly running is saying, uh-uh, that's not right. You better not do that. You better not, uh-uh, you know, you just screwed up again. Don't do that. That's the wrong thing to do. So it's an ongoing, very tiring existence to be in that place. And so fortunately, the Enneagram came along made me realize how critical I was being to a certain extent. And now I can say, okay, here come to judge. And so wherever <laughs> I get into a situation where I know that, that it's going to, you know, I'm going to be self-critical at a big, big level, I can just laugh about it. And I say, okay, here comes the judge again, you know, right there. All right, I get it. And that, that is, <laughs> that's helped a lot. Not totally, but it's helped a lot. And in terms of... Um, I don't know. I, I'm, what about, I'm blathering. What about your anger? What's that been for? Do you relate well, to anger and various derivatives? Or yeah, how, what does no. that look like for you? What for causes it? Most of my, my life, it was uh, annoyance and mm -hmm. irritation. 
and frustration and so and so isn't doing something the right way or so and you know such and such isn't right i mean <laughs> this day and age uh it, the if you watch the news every night you really get a good chance to be uh, a critical one because of the sort of stuff that's going on in the world the um uh i think that the, but it's as now it really has blossomed into a good anger mm. I, mm -hmm. I consider it to be a good i get angry mm -hmm. Right, you know, mm -hmm. and it's not, um, and I, to me, I give myself permission to be angry because there's something to be angry about. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I don't let it dominate my life either. So it's a balance. So mm -hmm. I can tell when I'm going to get angry and what's, when it's going to come up. I can tell if it's going to be appropriate anger. And I can tell if I can, you know, just feel that and let it go. Mm -hmm. But um, it still takes a lot of work. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot mm -hmm. of effort. Mm -hmm. Any ongoing. <coughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Bill? The, the way the inner critic works for me, it, it's not like I have two personalities, but the inner critic is always in the background. I thought when I started therapy 40 years ago as a client that I would eliminate this from my life. With my deep knowledge of the Enneagram, I thought I would eliminate this from my life. Mm -hmm. I haven't eliminated this from my life. Mm -hmm. I carry it every day. I don't know when it's going to be most vocal or most uh, vitriolic, but it's always present. I'll find myself observing it a lot, and it's a great gift to me, but I don't observe it all the time. I'm trapped by it before I observe it. Richard Rohr calls the superego the devil, and I love that image because I feel my superego is subverting my true self, working to, out of the obverse desire to protect me, from the world. <clears throat> and the conundrum that creates for me is um, it can be disheartening. I turned 70 uh, recently and I thought when I was 60, I thought, well, when I'm 70, <laughs> I'm not thinking 80 is going to be a lot easier. <laughs> so I, I'm aware I live with this um, super critic at all times and it's exhausting. It can uh, reduce me. Uh, I have been in the fetal position in my adult life two or three times in which my resources, which I think are large and um, powerful, were vacated from me. Um, uh, something on anger. The, one of the ways ones are often understood is having hidden anger. Mm -hmm. And I don't see my anger readily. I feel it. But like you, it comes out often as resentment. I can be resentful over minutia. And it really is not about the other. It's about the way I am treating myself, that I'm judging the minutia as being less than perfect. The anger and the perfectionism are twinned always with me. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, my spouse is generous in suggesting when there may be some anger somewhere in my repertoire. <laughs> As a nine would do, <laughs> and I'm very grateful for that. Mm. And <clears throat> I've learned to befriend my anger, mm. meaning that my anger has uh, many good aspects. I have been committed to social justice issues my whole life, and my social justice commitments are deeply informed by an anger I feel about human beings treated with less dignity than they deserve. And I see that um, all the time. Mm -hmm. Perhaps we all do. I can only claim my own experience. Um, and I've learned to recognize that anger as a tool. Like, Bill, you're seeing something. You have to pay attention to this. You have to deal with this in the way that I feel called to deal with that. Uh, I don't have anger that lashes out. Uh, I really have never had anger that lashes out. Um, it lashes out at me. I was going to say, was it more on you, really, lash out at you? Versus really trained to go inside mm -hmm. because the threat with the parent as my mm -hmm. colleagues here have suggested, was you cannot lash out at the parent. It's too dangerous. Mm -hmm. It's, it's life-threatening. Mm -hmm. So you learn to take that appropriate anger at the other mm -hmm. and hold it inside and manage it yourself, even at the great cost. Mm -hmm. That self-management of that anger and judgment mm -hmm. um, are for you. Mm -hmm. You know, speaking of the inner critic, one time I have a good friend who's a one. Mm -hmm. And I, I really love this guy. He's a good friend. And... I would get kind of mad at his inner critic. And one time he pointed out to me, he said, well, wait a minute, 
He said, if it weren't for my inner critic, I'd be dead or in jail. That's right. mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, and, and so I realized, whoa, like it's not so clear cut here. Um, it's not just like a- inner critic bad, you know, it's like, okay, there's, it, it's an inner coach. It's helping you. It's helping you survive. And it's also at times hurting you. Um, so it sounds like part of it is getting to know the inner critic a little bit like Matt earlier in the nine panel said he got, he needed to get to know his sleepiness. Um, getting to know the inner critic and understand how it operates for you and bring consciousness to it as opposed to doing another thing where you're making yourself bad or making some part of you bad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and just wanted to follow on to Bill that yeah. came to mind as an example about anger after years of kind of learning about my anger and learning to be with it and just getting some experience with it, then I can remember, for example, a time at work when I saw something was uh, software engineering, uh, something was off and it was important and I knew how to do it in a good way and and this anger was up at like this is wrong this is bad and it's important uh and i i just filled with energy and i just charged in and started working on this project and it was just full of energy and enthusiasm mm-hmm. and focus and i just ripped through this project did a fabulous job and felt wonderful about it. Mm. And I could tell that the anger was my gas, my part of, juice. Part of what was fueling you. It was my fuel. Yes. And it was and it was being used in a really good yes. way. I was fixing an important thing in the system. I felt yes. really good about doing it. Yeah. And I wasn't hurting anybody. I wasn't criticizing right. anybody. And it's it, like yeah. Bad things happen in the world, and it's not necessarily anybody's fault, and it doesn't matter if it mm-hmm. if it is. It's like, I want to fix this, and there's the energy yes. to do it. It's not like, oh, damn, I have to go do this. It's like, oh, boy, let's go. Yes, yes, it's and it terrific. sounds like feeling good about yourself, oh, too, absolutely. instead of beating yeah, yourself up. Yeah, the whole thing anyway. is just a great experience. So this may be a good moment to say that, in my, in my opinion, um, Nelson Mandela and Gandhi were once. And this is an example of the way anger channeled consciously can change the world. You know, I think in both cases you see, and there's even a quote Gandhi has that's pretty famous about anger used consciously has this incredible uh, power. Um, and so again, I think one of any things that Enneagram teaches us is the difference between sort of the downside and some of these ways that that we've heard of you all getting actually hurt by these coping strategies, uh, but also how how they sort of point to your high side um, is the this this way that if we bring in consciousness, um, it shifts everything. Um, if you can be conscious of what's happening, and especially compassion, I think for yourself as a one. The uh, the Tibetan understanding of the anger emotion is separates into two things. One is the is the energy that's a destructive energy, and the one is the uh, constructive energy. Mm-hmm. And if you can really become acquainted with your anger, then you can separate those two. Right. Uh, right, right. And it's often, I think, with ones, it's being put to service and helping. My, my, both my father and my brother were a family of four are ones. Um, and whenever I brought something that I've written to my dad to say, hey, would you read this? His first, his first question is always, can I take out my red pen and circle the typos <laughs> and the mistakes? Right. Because he would not be able to read it without doing that. It's nice that he asks for permission. <laughs> Um, and of course he's helping me at the same time. Um, and so there is a way that, that he, that that's, that's the way the mind works. So can you tell us all a little bit more about the high side or the strengths associated with this style? And especially as you become conscious and move toward, uh, sort of 
beyond the personality, but of course our high side is a reflection of our personality. Um, and also some of the particular ways you've used Enneagram insights to grow, any blind spots or challenges you've actually used uh, to, to develop. I didn't realize that Mandela and uh, Gandhi were yes, ones. Yes, they are. And all my South African friends agree that Good Mandela company. is a one. I like yeah, that. Yeah. That's that's great. That's I, right. uh, <laughs> teachers and preachers. That's well, the one. Well, in some ways, the moral white knights of the world. And, yes. you know, not, certainly not all moral white knights are ones, but many. The uh, ability to pick up little flaws and details um, although it can be um, burdensome, at the same time it can be very, very helpful to others. And when you're doing work that is, requires awareness of detail and keeping things straight and keeping things uh, working properly, um, I think that benefits everyone. And it feels good inside because if, if it's done in a way that isn't criticizing somewhere else and not ideally not <laughs> dumping on yourself too much that uh, it can create a lot of it's it's the good use of energy so it goes out there and we can solve problems we can get uh, things done it has, there's energy is wonderful I love the energy mm. of that eight mm -hmm. panel mm -hmm. I mean I was just grooving on that energy that mm -hmm. was mm -hmm. yeah like that, <laughs> you know and um, so it is it is a way to create uh, you know to set boundaries it's a way to uh, set mm -hmm. a direction. It's a way to move in that direction. Mm -hmm. And so all of those things, of course, it's the right way to do it. But uh, <laughs> the, the, all of those things are, 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 I think, a positive side of the one. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I associate being a one a lot with the gut, with my gut. Mm -hmm. And I associate my gut um, deeply with intuition. Mm -hmm. I've learned to trust my intuition as absolutely as I can and have since the day I got sober and came out 40 years ago. And these are some of the ways that that plays in my life. Um, ones I think see clearly what's in front of them. They're required to see in order to stay safe, in order to comport themselves in a way that will not get them in trouble. But the upside of seeing is they see. Mm -hmm. Our culture is not a seeing culture. We don't look. So in my work as a therapist for 40 years, uh, I think my capacity to see others was a gift to others. It's a gift to me, certainly. Uh, it can also be a burden for others when I see them. Um, I have many experiences in life where people see seen by me and I'm kind of unaware that I have communicated that I'm seeing them. It invites a certain level of trust in me and an ide a certain idealization of me or of the seer. Mm -hmm. And then when the one who's seen no longer wants to be seen, the de-idealization process begins. Mm -hmm. Of course, I'm unaware of that until I'm on the ground. <laughs> yeah. But I would claim that seeing is, has been an enormous gift. Yeah. I trust what I see. Um, in my professional life, in my personal life, uh, I think my anger has been a gift to others. People come into my office over 40 years without access to their anger or their sadness. Mm -hmm. So they're somatized into mm -hmm. what nines were speaking against clearly today of trying to have a feeling life. And the feelings that are most taboo in our culture to me are anger and sadness. Mm -hmm. And they're feelings. They're, they're feelings. Mm -hmm. And they're required of us to have a good life. Mm -hmm. So my ability to articulate anger and powerfully sadness have been, mm -hmm. I think, vital for me to feel what I'm sad about, but also vital for the people I have served. One anecdote, my, my father-in-law is 93, and he, he and I are dear friends. He's a widower now. Um, we talk a lot. We, we have, he, call, he calls me and says, do you have an opening in your practice this morning? <laughs> <laughs> and I'll say, I have 10 o'clock open. And he says, I'll meet you at the office, which is Pete's in Santa Rosa. <clears throat> <laughs> and not so long ago, he said to me, I, I want to tell you, you brought much to our family, and I know that, and I've received much from his family. But he said, the greatest gift you've given Scott, my husband, and me is you've given us access to our anger. Wow. Scott's mother and I were not capable of telling him how to have his anger. Mm. And being with you, 
it's kind of required of him mm. that he has anger. And I took that as, uh, as kind of a, affir a life affirmation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That this anger is a good thing, mm -hmm. it's a clear thing, and it's an absolutely necessary thing to have a full life. So those are the upsides. The downsides are evident all over my neurotic self. Mm -hmm. The cork in my butt, that's the downside. <laughs> it's just all, but there are many upsides. And I'm, as I said in my opening remarks, I'm very grateful to be a one or to be this person. Because the gift of the one is to say to me, there's, there's a passage in Christian, in Christian scripture in which Jesus says, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Mm -hmm. I was raised with that. I couldn't stand that. Mm -hmm. But I've come to know as an adult what that invitation was. Perfection for you, Bill, is to be your true self. Yes. Mm -hmm. To be your true self. Yes. That is your only work in this to life. To be exactly who you are. No one has to agree with that. No one has to like it, though many do. I'm blessed with a lot of love. But your, your work is to find out who you are and be that person. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is the clarity that I received as a one. Mm -hmm. I want to expand a little bit on what you said about seeing, because I think what's, what, set, what one's gifts are, it's a lot about discernment and objective analysis. Uh, there's a kind of rationality that's, that, that, that's, again, it's about seeing what's really there and not being afraid to see what's really there. I think for a lot of us other types, we kind of want to focus on the positive and not the negative, or we want to focus on this and not that. We don't want to, you know, experience that. But one's a little bit like fours, I think, or kind of like, okay, let's be with what's really true. Let's let's call a spade a spade. Let's if there's a problem here, we're going to point to it and we're going to describe it, and so we can address it. So I think there's even some. Uh, I like what you said about seeing and and calling something out, and there's this kind of uh, uh, courage. The, of just uh, wanting, because you want to improve things or address things, there's a kind of willingness to, to see things as they are and name them uh, with great objectivity often. Yeah. I'll, just, I'll just add my own vocabulary Please. to that. It's, Please. It's, uh, it's a knowing. Mm -hmm. To me, it's more like that than a seeing. Mm -hmm. Just like... Is it kinesthetic or...? It's... it's Gut knowing it's, is it's it? It's in, instinctive. Instinctive. It's, it's just it's mm -hmm. a it's a it's a knowing. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know how to describe it. It's not a mental process. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. What what I thought of saying is that uh, as learning to be what Enneagram One is about and so on. Some of the things that I eventually learned that was very helpful was that being critical, resentful, and angry, and nitpicky, and all of this stuff, just to see more clearly that my motivation is actually positive, even though I can be a pain to myself and others, that I want things to go well. I want things to go smoothly. I want things to be easier for everyone, easy and beautiful and without a hassle. You know, and that's kind of my the the motivation of this perfection. If I can let down some of the neurotic parts, is like I want this to be an easy, good life for me and for everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, so to see that, like, there's a positive aspect here that's that's worth nurturing. Right, um, Dale. Can you tell the story? You told a great story on a panel once, and I think it highlights what the difference between I think what's always good intentions and desire for positive outcome with how it can sometimes land in a different place for others. Mm -hmm. You told a great story about when you were working as an engineer, you were helping a junior engineer yeah, right. and you, yeah. I, I remember. So that that was a, a real important learning experience for me. You know, I being in software engineering my whole life, it's a, it's a place where you can just be with the computer and work with something where the rules are known and it, it doesn't have any feelings about them. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a kind of a, a, a safe, easy place for me to be, you know, having not good access to my feelings. This was like really an appealing environment. So years later, I was a team leader and we hired a bunch of uh, new grads out of college, and I was 
helping, coaching, teaching uh, some of these uh, bright young people, you know, about software engineering as they were doing their jobs. And my normal way back then, um, someone would write some software and give it to me for inspection. And I would have a red pen <laughs> and uh, a green pen and uh, three colors. I forget the three colors. Three different colors. And like the red things are things that are just wrong. It could be a misspelled word or it could be, you know, this software does the wrong thing here. This is like, this is just doesn't work. Uh, and then there are things which a different color was this could be done in a way that's simpler or more elegant or easier to understand or easier for the next engineer to understand when they come here. So there's a better way to do this that would be worth doing. And then the last thing is just like, these are little things that would be lovely, but they're not required. So there were like three different levels of color coded of comments coming back. And there would be uh, the pages would just be filled with all of these colors. Like, oh, my God. And eventually. My manager came to me and said this junior programmer. She was in tears. She was just heartbroken and didn't know what to do and felt crushed. She was just having a terrible time and I was shocked to hear this because for me it's like if I had gotten the, the marked up paper that I had given to her I would have been probably upset and it's like okay I'm going to fix this and make it perfect and the energy would come up and like <laughs> fix all of these things and fix all of those things and you know I'd be engaged and wanting wanting to make my work perfect mm -hmm for various good and neurotic reasons. But to discover, like, I'm putting out all of these comments to teach you to be the world's best programmer, and she's crushed. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, my God, mm -hmm. this hurts people. Mm -hmm. And I really never saw that before. I didn't really see it clearly. Like, mm -hmm. this has a beneficial intent but it can really hurt people. Mm -hmm. And to learn that gave me a whole new view of what's helpful in the world mm -hmm. instead of what's the right way. Mm -hmm. You know, it's nearby. They're not too mm -hmm. far away. Yeah. Right? I mean, uh, but a big difference. And so that led to me looking a lot at is this error just my habit of mind just my critic it just comes up and does a thing all the time and it actually doesn't matter right mm -hmm. i mean a year or two after that my boss told me you know when you when i uh, give you a, a paper to read or something and I want your feedback and it comes back all marked up and it's like I look for the ideas that are comments but all the uh, typos and misspellings and bad grammar is like I just ignore all those like <laughs> oh really um, <laughs> so I get to see that a lot of it's just a waste of time it actually doesn't make any difference you know mm -hmm. fixing all these little things you know mm -hmm. fix this little thing it doesn't make any difference to anybody, mm -hmm. even me. <laughs> right, 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 right. It makes a difference to me, but it's right. it's a habitual irritation with things. Mm -hmm. And it would be better for me to look at my irritation and befriend my irritation mm -hmm. instead of spending my time trying to make the irritation happy, which will never happen. Mm -hmm. It's endless. Mm -hmm. right, right. So to, to make it perfect or assert yeah. the, the rightness of things. So my uh, my teaching partner, Uranio Pius, has something that he says about ones that I love. And this is a way of pivoting a little even more to sort of what's helped you grow, what practices, what experiences. He says, but it's tricky because for ones, 
they're already overdoing self-improvement, <laughs> right. right? So if you're a coach or a therapist and you're working with a one, you're kind of in dangerous territory because if you come on with your usual thing of, okay, how are we gonna make you better? You're sort of taking them in the wrong direction and giving them the wrong message. And so what my, my, my teaching partner says is, all the other types have to get better Ones have to get worse. <laughs> they have to get more decadent. <clears throat> they have to get bad. Go make some mistakes. Exactly. And make mistakes and don't care about it. You know? Well, make mistakes and see what <laughs> make mistakes and see what happens. Make some mistakes and see what happens. So with that in mind, and the idea that sometimes the growth path for ones has less to do about um, being better in the sense that some of us, the rest of us need to be better, but more to do with relaxing more, taking care of yourself more, having more fun, uh, maybe even stirring up a little trouble. Um, what, what, what examples might you have in your life of experience or practices or, you know, they can fall in that category or not that have helped you kind of break out of, of this, of this pattern, this, this habit of mind. The trap door. <laughs> well, the trap door is different. That's, that's, so if you haven't heard of trap door ones, um, trap door one is the one who, um, has so much pressure on him to do himself or herself to do the right thing for so long that then engages in bad behavior on the down low, right? Um, and so an example of this might be Elliot Spitzer. So some of you may know the attorney general and governor of New York, who is a crusader for, you know, putting white collar criminals away and prostitution and all this, you know, the enforcing the law and then gets caught having a long-term uh, relationship with a prostitute. Right. So it's like all this pressure to be good. And instead of learning how to either be bad in a good way or learning to take the pressure off somehow, there's a release valve that's kind of like a trap door um, that's in some ways probably relieving the pressure to be so controlled and good all the time, but isn't the healthiest thing probably for him. You know, again, whether it's the secrecy or without any value judgments, the secrecy or whatever, having to, you know, make your get get happy or have pleasure uh, behind the scenes or in a way that's not that maybe he even still thinks is not OK. Um, but but again, part of what you know, and, and part of this could be how can we support you? Uh, because I think when ones grow, uh, they're amazing to be around. Uh, because it's this combination of a lot of what, especially I think the way Bill was putting it, this kind of seeing, this kind of knowing, this kind of supporting, this uh, bringing to bear anger in the world in ways that really help and move things and make things happen and like, or the, it's the force behind social causes. Um, but how do how does this also work for you? You know, in order to help you be lighter, or I, I know humor is often something that that helps, but what, what, what experiences and practices and things have you done to really help yourself on the growth path? This is tough for a one. Yeah, that, that, that's it's what tough. I'm asking. <laughs> People say to me often, are you happy? And I yeah. think, what does that, what do you mean by that word? Yes. It's, uh, it isn't an intuitive word for me. Yeah, yeah. Are you I enjoying you yourself? I go, I might be, let me define enjoy. <laughs> Right definition. Yes. Um, and uh, I think uh, ones are prone to have trap doors. I've had my trap doors mm -hmm. uh, over the course of my life. Um, they're not real bad, but they're real trappy. <laughs> uh, they're, they're very secretive because they uh, are transgressive over the ideal perfect self. I'll tell you the things I do that bring me enjoyment. Mm -hmm. The garden, running, being with friends is the great elixir is being with friends. I have very few one friends. So I'm with all kinds of people who approach life with a lot more lightness or transgressive goodness or... So I love being with friends. I love movies. 
I love music. I have music on. I've learned to have music on every day from shortly after I get up. I start the morning with Celtic music, and then I move to Aretha and Motown in the midday, <laughs> and then I have jazz at night, and I do this every day to keep me off of myself because if the Perfect music's example. on, yeah. the inner critic has less chance to invade whatever space exists between the inner critic and my true self, which is... Mm -hmm. Uh, so music's very important to me. Dancing mm -hmm. is important to me. Mm -hmm. uh, humor, you mentioned. Uh, many ones have very acute humor in my experience. Yes, definitely. Uh, they see things with such a jaundiced clarity <laughs> <laughs> that it, it adds to uh, humor in life. A meditation uh, uh, in my spiritual path, uh, I began doing about 20 years ago. I've had a spiritual practice for 50 years. A daily practice, but it did not include what we in this room would understand as meditation. But meditation has given me space in my life, and space is a, a gift uh, of joy. Um, I My inner critic, for 25 minutes, just loves meditation. Just It just loves it. And I work with that every day, and yet I'm drawn to go back every morning. I go back to sit. So I'm really grateful for meditation and for all my neo-Buddhist friends who told me it was okay for me to meditate on my path. I'm grateful for that. Um, I do a lot of public speaking and I get a lot of satisfaction out of public speaking and being with people, sharing my journey, the parts that are applicable or value for others. So those are some things I do. None of them are like wild. I know wild, and I did wild for a long time with the help of alcohol, but this is a really, it's a tough question. It's a life question. Mm -hmm. What do you do to let let it out? It's, mm -hmm. it's hard, but I appreciate the question. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I think for me, the, my sense is that the really important things for me were not mental, uh, the uh, uh, yoga and a good yoga teacher was a big opening and important thing for me to start learning about my body and the sensate experience and uh, the sens sensate experience of living in a body that's dynamic and changing because uh, I had very little awareness of that. And my sense now is that's the kind of the most fundamental or important component of my makeup, right? So, so to, through yoga, to really learn, to experience, you know, my body and myself as a, as a sensate experience, mm -hmm. not a mental experience, not a thought experience, was really important. Uh, sitting meditation, uh, I always thought meditation was a mental training, but Zen meditation anyway, it's a physical practice. And if you do that physical practice, you learn a lot of stuff about body and sensation and what those things cause, like fear and confusion and all kinds of stuff arise from the body and the sensate experience. So uh, I think fundamentally that was the most important thing in terms of the overall learning experience for me because as long as those doors of understanding are closed, life is just going to be small and limited, right? And along that same line, about the same time that I came to the Enneagram, uh, my marriage of 20 plus years exploded and I was just thrown into this emotional turmoil that was so strong I couldn't repress it. Mm. So suddenly I was this very emotional being like, oh my God. Uh, and having that crisis, uh, disaster, opened me up uh, was a great opportunity, you know, and with the talented therapist, to learn to not be afraid of of experiencing my feelings and then being able to gradually listen to them and see, 
what are they saying? What does this mean? What's, what is this telling me about me and about life and how I'm responding? Uh, so that was another great gift and opportunity. It's like up until the first half of my life, it was like television that was black and white. And when I learned about the body and learned about feelings, it's like, oh my God, it's color. Life is color. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> And three dimensional. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh my God. Mm -hmm. Right. And then and then I, I can experience my sadness and my anger mm -hmm. and and my care for other people as really what they are at their root. It's not just an idea. Mm -hmm. It's not just a should. Mm -hmm. It's really it's about love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What was the question? <laughs> What brings us joy in life? Yeah, how's that one? How do you grow through pleasure and fun and, and, and how do you break out of the pattern of needing to be right or good or that, that can be, you know, a, a way of being too good and, and, and how do you break out of that as a growth, as a strategy for growth? As a body type, I can um, <laughs> definitely agree with everything I've heard. Uh, for me, dance has been a big one. I've been dancing mm -hmm. since the 60s. And when I get into mm -hmm. dance, um, often I just totally forget myself. And mm -hmm. uh, admittedly, it was uh, performing dance for quite a while. And so there you have to be perfect. You have to know exactly what you're doing. But then letting that go and then just the, the sheer joy of the music and being with uh, a partner or being with a group or whatever it is, it just takes me away. And so... Uh, I think that's one of the biggest, as a body type, it fits, right? I mean, you know, we like to go out, use our bodies. Just being in nature, walking, uh, hiking, or I used to do a lot of jogging until my feet decided to tell me they didn't want to do that anymore. Uh, <laughs> but um, the, uh, yeah, it's all kind of one thing that gives me an incredible amount of joy now and gets me out of myself are my grandkids. Mm -hmm. And I've got... Mm -hmm. Two granddaughters that I love like hell, two grandsons that I just love the tickets out of. And so, you know, when I'm around them, I'm not here. I'm just doing whatever it is that we all have to do together. And uh, so, and and without judgment, by golly, that is kind of one of those free spaces. It's a, a free zone I can go into. And not, uh, of course, then after they leave, I think, well, I really should have played that different game. I mean, I really should have done some <laughs> And it's that damn should word that really gets to you all the time. You know, it's one way or another. But, um, yeah. Okay. So we've been talking about the Arrow Lions today, and it's no accident that the heart point, the point against the arrow from one is seven. <clears throat> right? Seven is the type that's most focused on pleasure, that's most focused on the positive, on keeping spirits up, having fun, um, different options, um, not being limited, not being constrained. Um, and so when ones can use seven as a growth strategy, and this is a good thing to do after you've been working on your one patterns for a while, um, sort of going to the high side of seven, you know, seeing the value in focusing on pleasure, on, ke on, on keeping your spirits up, on having fun, on... Uh, planning for play and possibilities for fun, like looking at the world through that lens and, you know, keeping things really light and not being too serious. Uh, all of these are ways that I think the seven, the high side of seven can be uh, a way of one's uh, sort of balancing out uh, their type patterns. And then once you have worked on seven, they go back to one. And then one's stress point is four. So the stress point of four is kind of like, it's sort of kind of hard and not okay at first for ones to be in their feelings. You know, we've heard some great, uh, some great things here about how on the one hand, feelings weren't okay and had to be repressed. And on the other hand, on the growth path, it's really important to get in touch with your anger and your sadness and to have learn that that's completely okay and that that's an important part of life. Um, and so once ones can kind of get the loosen up with the seven point, they can go to four and be creative without rules. 
Uh, they can be self-express in whatever way they want without having to conform to a, an idea of what other people might think is perfect or even maybe what they think is perfect. Um, they can get more, sink more into their emotions and have that be a rich experience that uh, enhances their, their connection to themselves like it does for healthy fours. Uh, and not have and, and, and give themselves more permission to be emotional, uh, more permission to be with their pain uh, and have that deepen their experience and make it uh, richer and not something that they need to repress in any way or criticize inside themselves. So that's a little bit about the seven and the four move. Um, and with that, I want to, I want to ask one, before we go to questions, I just want to say, is there anything I haven't asked you about that you think is important for us to know about ones about you or about your experience as a one? Uh, not specifically, but it seems to me that one of the important things we haven't mentioned, at least here is, is the, is the practice, practice, practice of looking inside, calming yourself, looking inside and seeing what's happening. And that's just that simple practice, it seems to me, is the fundamental mm -hmm. tool we all have mm -hmm. for discovering how does this living amazing system work mm -hmm. that, that it, really helps you just it, giving it, yourself remembering to just look inside and be with what's right, over there right yeah. a thousand times a day i mean it's so valuable mm -hmm. uh and it's not just a mental look inside it's like at least for me it's like take a breath let your shoulders relax it's like a beat with let being. your mind settle yeah. and then like what is this mm -hmm. And just, it's so valuable. Mm. One of my, one of my, I was an Enneagram teacher for a while, and one of my students uh, was in the training to learn to be a teacher. He'd gone through all of the training, was about to go to his final training and and uh, approval, hopefully, and he arrived at my door. And he said, I'm not a nine. I'm a six. Oh. This is after two years or three years of study of the Enneagram and all this work. And he said, finally, I saw in my meditation, in my solitude, what keeps coming up, it's fear. Mm. And I was so used to it. It's just mm. normal. It's like... The water you swim in, you know, the fish swims in. But he says, that's what keeps coming up. And I finally saw it. Mm -hmm. I'm a six. Yep. And he was. Thank you. Yep. Wow. I'll, I'll speak to one piece. <clears throat> I mentioned my own spiritual path. I think having a spiritual path is a complicated thing. Mm -hmm. Using language is complicated. Um, on the left coast, talking about a spiritual path is... I think particularly difficult, but my own path has been what it's been. And <clears throat> each year I go to a monastery in Northern Oregon, a Trappist monastery, where there are monks who don't speak and are silent. And I go there for eight days every year. And my spiritual path is deeply wedded with my oneness. I have spent uh, a 70 year journey trying to make myself perfect in the eyes of the divine. Mm -hmm. However, I understand the divine and whatever projections I make onto the divine and whatever projections I have the divine projecting back onto me, all the work of my own <clears throat> ego and self. <laughs> Several years ago, I was in, they have a Zendo there, even though they're Roman Catholic monks. Um, and there's no iconography in the Zendo, and it has a two-story window looking into the forest. It's very beautiful. And I'm often the only one there, and I'm there several times a day. Meditation hall. Yes, a meditation hall. And I uh, always have prayed to try to understand the divine within. And it's been resistant to me because I have perfected myself to require of myself that I be worthy of that, mm -hmm. which is a worthiness I cannot self-generate. Mm -hmm. And I had an experience that, <clears throat> as we do, we hear voices in our lives. And I 
heard the voice, I'm already in you. Mm. <laughs> and it was, it was as if, no, not as if, it was this uh, acceptance that my work, and this is something you said struck me, my work was futile and necessary at the same time. <laughs> I had to do that work, which was a lot of psychological work, but within a spiritual context and using spiritual language and spiritual traditions to come to know the deepest truth I could know so that I could learn to live out of that. And the key word in that was not only I'm within you, but I'm within you, as you are, Bill. There's no more work. Of course, there's more work. But... Um, you remind me of something. I, I work with a spiritual counselor myself, and she said something to me recently that was so powerful and really shifted things for me. She said, you know... And she was she sort of channels spirit in a way. She said, you know, the what you're what you're the place you're striving to be, you already are. Mm -hmm. Enjoy paradise. Enjoy the paradise that you're in. And it was like, whoa, <laughs> because I I, what I am was striving, you know, and to realize like you already and I because I, I took that in. It was like, wow, what a relief. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Put that word enjoy you used. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. Maybe I'm a two. I can do that. So <laughs> I'm a little more in the enjoyment arena. Although I totally hear one time someone asked me about like, are you happy? And I, my 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 response was, ah, that's not really the goal. But <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's not exactly you know. But anyway, yeah. So I'd like to open up for questions, but first I want to ask Michael if you have any comments or questions for the panel. Well, again, uh, the third extraordinary panel of the day. Um, I, um, I love working with ones, and um, there are four or five ones who work actively at the core of Commonweal in one way or another, one of our projects is entirely staffed by ones. And it's three, three ones working together, and, and I work with them. It's one other person who's joined us. But, uh, and it's amazing to work with three ones together. I mean, you know, uh, just <laughs> remarkable. And the work gets done. It gets done beautifully. There is not a lot of friction. Um, there is a strong tendency to go to infinite detail and to... <laughs> You know, ask, uh, want to be sure that everything, I get asked a lot of things, you know, to make sure that we're on target. But I love it. Um, one, one thing, and I have some very dear friends who are ones. And um, so two points. One is um, I'd like to ask about, which is the evolution of the inner critic slash coach over time. I have some friends for whom the inner critic was extremely strong when they were young, and over time, they found ways of working with it or managing it, or it became more mellow or whatever. Um, uh, the second is that um, with one friend uh, who was very focused on being perfect, um, the, the holy idea of holy perfection, which is the holy idea of one, which is hard for some people to imagine, but imagine just for a moment that the, not only are you perfect just as you are with your imperfection, but the whole universe is perfect just as it is. And, of course, that triggers us all about all the injustices and how can we say it's perfect. But the way I understand that is that the universe is unfolding with perfect attention to... Uh, natural laws, you know, and we on earth will learn by our ignorance of these natural laws. But the fact is that if one identifies with the perfection of the universe, that it, that, that enables all of us, including ones, to say, you know, my imperfection uh, is part of the perfection of the universe. 
And as a five, I see myself as radically imperfect because I don't have any inner critic voice at all. You know? <laughs> so that's just not happening for me. And so, you know, I have a much easier time being radically imperfect than, than a one does. But I'm able to, I'm a big believer in the perfection of the universe and its infinite mysterious beauty. And so when I can share that with my one friend, we find a, a meeting place. Um, so as a, as a social sexual five, particularly meeting social one friends with the uh, resonance that takes place between social ones and social five, um, I just enjoy our dialogues, our interactions, and the respect we both have for boundaries. Mm -hmm. uh, there's just a lot that I find really beautiful in relationship with one. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you. You didn't say the subtypes. Is everybody yeah. social so you ones? No. Um, you want to say your subtypes? I'm a one-to-one. -one. I'm a sexual. self press. Yeah. And I don't know if you guys are going by the approach I use or another approach, but that just might be something to name that there are different approaches to. For, for me, the my partner and the people who are close to me, my friends, are the most important emotional force in my life. If they get messed up, I am totally messed up. Mm -hmm. It's like the most important thing, and uh, for self press stuff, it's really it's just kind of not an issue. If something is a problem there, I just deal with it, and it's really doesn't. I don't get stirred up about it. Uh, and social, I for social things, I feel kind of ignorant and uh, you know not knowing how to function. But it's not terribly disturbing for me either. But it's the one-to-one -one relationships that's really powerful in my life. So that's, uh, and when I'm talking to a group of people, my experience is if I'm looking at anybody, it's, it feels like I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you, one person. Right, right. And he's, and, talking, and this, yeah. he's talking, to, yeah, you're talking too, I think about the way the narrative approach approaches it in terms of very much the instinctual descriptions. Oh, okay, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah. Could you, could you clarify that? I'm sorry, just the piece about your approach and the narrative sure. approach. Sure, so the way Dale is really focusing on the idea of like his experience of really relating one-to-one. -one. Um, and, and that is, uh, the, especially the narrative school, which we were both raised in, okay. uh, very much focuses a lot on describing that. Like self-preservation would be about like, do you bring supplies on trips? Are you kind of worried about how cold or hot or when you're going to eat, things like that? Um, in the approach I use, it's a little bit different because while some of that holds true, um, it's mixed with the, the passion. And so um, it's more, my approach is a little bit more based on subtype descriptions where those shift and change a little bit more. Um, so in my approach, for instance, the, the, the way I would describe the three one subtypes wouldn't be so much focused on like one to one relating. It, it's more like what you do with your anger or not. It's more like how much it's repressed, how self-critical you are. It's, it's like the self-preservation one is more pre perfectionistic. The social one is perfect and the sexual one is perfecting others. And the, this, the self-preservation one is, is more self-critical, the sexual is least self-critical, more critical of other people. So again, that's just, it's the later Naranjo approach. It's a little bit more of a focus on the subtype, which is his kind of blending of that instinctual part with the passion. And then it, this, it ends up looking a little bit different. Whereas a lot of people's approach is much more based on this question of, when I observe myself, am I more focused on sort of my one-to-one -one relationships, even if I'm in a group, as, as Dale said very clearly, I'm kind of still relating one-to-one, -one, or am I more about safety and security as a self-preservation? The, the different approaches kind of go more, like one kind of looks at the subtype descriptions and says, which one of these three am I? And the other one kind of looks more at the instinct, the instinct behaviors, uh, and says, which one fits for me? So that, yeah. 
Could, does that mean if you kind of typed yourself under the narrative tradition approach, and then we look at your subtypes, that we might not end up with the same? Could be. Could be, yeah. But we also might. You might, yeah. It could go either way. Yeah, it, it, would, it, would be, it might be a little bit different, or it might be the same, but just a different accent or something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I want to speak just for a second to Michael's uh, question about the, but the durability and the vociferousness of the inner critic. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I believe all human beings are wounded. I believe ones are wounded in a very particular way. And the inner critic is designed by the ego to protect the self. Yeah. So initially, it's a thoughtful approach of the ego, one might say. Mm -hmm. I think its durability is related to the structure of the trauma. So if a person's initial trauma was severe, the inner critic will never leave them lest the severity of that original trauma be returned. Mm -hmm. If the original trauma was less severe, the utility of the superego will become, uh, it'll be observed as less important. I don't really need this to function. So you take someone like J.C. Dugard, the young woman who was kept captive for 17 years. I don't know her, but the level of trauma I believe she experienced was somewhat beyond comprehension. So she's going to have an inner critic or someone in her situation that is going to protect her until her last breath, lest she ever get near a situation that could be somewhat traumatic. And her antenna, her intuition will be deeply on guard at all times. Doesn't mean she or us can't live a full life, but there's a correlation between the original trauma and the vociferous of the uh, mm -hmm. superego's voice. Right, that's a good point. And I would say that applies to all the types in terms of level of fixation. That's right. So I, you know, this is a longer story. I believe we're born as our type, but of course our environment plays a role in how, what shapes how it shows up. And I think the more the trauma, the more fixated, because the more defended you need to be to survive. Uh, and doesn't mean that you can't still grow and change and become very, very healthy, uh, but it just may take more work because that defense, defensive system has needed to be so strong and rigid uh, to protect you from the greater threat. Uh, in terms of the, I'm glad you brought us back to the, uh, the inner critic question because um, in in work, my work with ones, I find that sometimes it happens in stages where there may be a stage where it's really good for the one to befriend the inner critic. Um, it can be hard if you're, it can, you almost be at war with yourself if your inner critic's in there trying to protect you, but kind of hurting you and being tough on you in the name of trying to protect you, going too far. Um, and Because again, maybe it had to be extreme to protect you. Um, but at a certain point when you're not under threat anymore, it's very important for that inner critic to be able to release uh, and not be so, so tough and so, so rigid. Um, and sometimes that can happen through a kind of befriending of the inner critic. Like my friend who said, hey, if, I, if I'd be dead or in jail if it weren't for my inner critic, I respect it, I can even appreciate it. it some, some people say it's almost like an inner coach who's like trying to help you be better, like saying, hey, you did that really well that time. Do it again that way next time. Or you didn't do it. You don't want to do it that way again because you got into trouble. Um, and I think that's really important. That said, I think there may be a stage even beyond that uh, where you can be too friendly with the inner critic and it can be a little bit too, you know, a little let, let the inner critic take some liberties that it may be better for it not to take. Um, so it, in, in order, it almost like the healthy part of yourself, your higher self to be able to come in and challenge it a bit sometime and, and be able to say something like, hey, hey, lay off a little bit, you know, a, a respect to what you're trying to do, but, you know, let, let's back off, you know, to be able to challenge the inner critic a little bit as well in the service of, of taking care of yourself in almost a higher way. What, yeah. One of the things in that regard that worked very well for me in retrospect, was in therapy, my therapist said, you know, something that I would, would see and say, that's wrong. He would say, try this. Can you say, that's different? <laughs> yes. And it was, yes. it was eye-opening. It's like I tried it. Like, okay, that's different. This has a different feeling to it. Like, yes. it's different. And if I can frame it as different, then I can actually think about it. Well, 
how is it different? How is it working? Mm -hmm. What are its aspects? You know, yes. maybe there's things I never thought about. If it's just wrong, then the story stops there. You know, the, the critic has just decided that's wrong and there's, there's no more narrative. But if I make it different, then you can investigate it. Well, it's different, so what is this? Right, and it's I like that technique. It's almost like sometimes you need to disrupt the one's definition system. Like mm -hmm. my friend who's a one said it really helped him once in couples therapy when he and his wife were having the same fight over and over again. Mm -hmm. And finally, the therapist said to him, look, would you rather be right or be happy? Right. And it was like, wow, like that, again, it totally... It was sort of a shock to the system to say, oh, wow, like I, insisting on right, I could be giving up happy. Yeah, to, to, to take the inner experience off of right and wrong and put it somewhere else, open right. the door to something Define else. Define it differently. Yeah. Is there something you wanted to say to that, Newt? Mm -hmm. To the inner critic? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, thanks. Okay, uh, <laughs> twice in my life, had, if I've had the experience of not having the inner critic... And one of the times was in a therapy session in the 90s where my therapist used MDMA. And so the idea of an empathogen or of um, psychedelic or whatever it happens to be is a way out of the cage that I put myself in. Of course, these things are transient. But another time later on when I was still getting, here comes the critic again, I simply used the old NLP method, Neuro Linguistic Programming, as soon as the critic uh, would arise within you, and I hear the critic come around and say, no! Mm -hmm. right. uh, yes. That energy hitting myself and just getting it out, I killed that inner critic in about six weeks or so. Wow. Mm -hmm. It stopped coming up. Mm -hmm. And I discovered that's not a good thing because the inner critic gives you useful information, mm -hmm. guiding information, mm -hmm. things that, you know, uh, are very useful to have in this life. So the inner critic's back now, but at least it knows that it's got a boss. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, Steve. Um, <clears throat> I have a question that has to do with liberation. You know the story of Eckhart Tolle, who had a punishing inner critic um, became very, very depressed. He says, I hate myself, I hate myself. And suddenly, in that moment, he said, what, are there two of me here? Because we're talking about the inner critic and the one who's criticized. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's really only one. Yeah. And that moment, it just completely, his personality, as he describes it, went down the drain, like mm -hmm. the water in the bathroom. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. And it never came back. Yeah. Wow. Now, mm -hmm. I have maybe a somewhat idealized and naive idea about how possible it is. Bill, you said something about, you thought this would be over at a certain point, and it's not. And I was thinking, maybe it's good that it's not, because you're, you're mentioning ways in which it's good that it's not over. And I really love the talk about this moment in time, this incarnation, this study with the Enneagram is perfect now. It has a future, but it doesn't have a goal. It has development, but it doesn't have a direction, necessarily. Yeah. Um, so I'm kind of between these two poles of, you know, hoping that this is going to happen to me too. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Nines have inner critics, too. Yeah. And, and, and other points. I, I'm interested in what the panel has to say about this question of liberation and freedom and the possession and the continuation of the inner critic and the inner dialogue. Yeah, yeah. I, I like I like framing it in terms of liberation. You know, what does liberation mean to you? Mm -hmm. I, I think I'd like to answer, but I'm unsure of what your question is. So <laughs> may, let, let me let me just try something, and maybe we'll see where we go. My experience is, it's a path, and. <clears throat> With, with our own dedication and commitment and the support of wise teachers and wise spiritual friends, changes happen. And that's enough. I think there are epiphanies in life. We have them. 
I was on my bike in 1978 driving on Lake Michigan, and I heard the words, you never have to drink again. Mm -hmm. I was a late-stage alcoholic, daily maintenance drinker for 15 years. It was lifted, and it never came back. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. It was a moment. It was a gift. I use the word gift. Another person can explain it psychologically. <clears throat> 20 years later, I was invited to come to San Quentin by a man who ran a group of like a growth group for men who had committed murder. And I had been giving a speech, and this guy came up to me and he said, I, I think you should come to work with me at San Quentin. I was working in the Tenderloin, running an AIDS agency for people dying, and he said, I think you should come to work at San Quentin. Mm -hmm. I dismissed that, but a year later he called me. I didn't know him, and he said, I think you should come. So I went. And to get into San Quentin, in the inner yard, you have to go through a series of doors, as some of you may know. And when I came through the third door into the yard, I felt the only time in my life I would use the word liberation, I felt utterly liberated in the yard at San Quentin. Mm. I've worked there for 20 years with men who have taken a human life who are among the bodhisattvas that I have had the grace to meet in this life. And every time I'm in San Quentin, every time I leave there alive and free. I'm on the freeway then, I'm not alive and free any longer. Mm. But I'm alive and free at San Quentin, which is why I go back. I love the man, I love the work. But something happens for me there, it's an epiphany. I don't, I, I don't determine that, but like all of us, I place myself in a place to be open to an experience that frees us of our various psychological, emotional, spiritual shackles. So that's the only answer I can really give is that mm. it comes, but not as we would expect or plan or even desire. I mean, Bill, I'm sorry, can, can you just say a little bit more, like why, why do you feel free? Like what's that feel like? Is it, just really it feels my chest is opened up. I'm allowed to be undefended. I'm there for three hours with a group of about 25 men, almost all men of color, almost all murderers, almost all men on whom mayhem was addressed as boys. And in their presence, I feel totally welcome as me. I can't tell you much more about that. I could analyze it psychologically. But I, what I know is the experience, and it's deep in my body. And it happened the moment I entered the yard. I was very afraid to go there. And when he said, we're going to work with men who have had a capital offense, I thought, this is not my path. <laughs> it is my path. But I didn't know that. And this man uh, came into my life and said, and now he's my dear friend, of course, 20 years later. It, it's, a, it's a liberation, and it is, uh, it's like pulled from without. It's, I, I can't describe it in uh, rational terms. We've used a lot today talking about reason versus intuition. Mm -hmm. It happens, and I, and I believe we all have these experiences, and we're called to trust them and to, move, to go with them. And I, but all I know is that's, that is the place on the planet Earth where I feel liberated is inside those walls. I think that's a beautiful note to end on. Um, I'll just say this. I think what, what you remind me of, Bill, is that one of the things I love most about the Enneagram is that it's, it, it can be, and again, uh, it can be this unbelievable blend of the psychological and the spiritual. Um, and I think, I think that growth tools are at their best when they have both aspects available. Sometimes you may just use the spiritual, sometimes just the psychological. Uh, but I think sometimes we see what happens when you don't have both available, as in a lot of things where like you have these spiritual teachers, big time spiritual teachers capable of a lot of spiritual uh, abil capacity who then are found out to be abusing people. Um, they haven't done their psychological work is usually the story. Um, similarly, you can get really psychological and, and, and not expand as much as you might if you don't have the spiritual available. And one of the things I liked about what Bill just said is it's, it's in some ways he's describing a spiritual experience. It's describing things in spiritual terms. He said, I could give you a psychological interpretation. Um, but there's something about, I think, when we have the intention to grow and when we follow a path, sometimes blindly, sometimes just with faith, 
um, that these kinds of things, beautiful things that can happen. And I think that's often when libera liberation happens. I think one of the great things about the Enneagram is you can talk about it in just spiritual language, in just psychological language, or neither or both. Mm -hmm. I think it, it's at its most powerful when you can use both. Uh, and so I appreciate being here because I think it's a good place to, to bring together both. Uh, but I use it in business as well. And sometimes I don't use either. It's just about practical, uh, practical language um, of, of being more emotionally intelligent or aware or effective uh, and things like that. Um, but so I want to stop here because this is the end of our panel time. Um, and I want to thank our ones very much for... I'd like to uh, add my gratitude for the one panel and to suggest that Rumi may have had ones in mind when he wrote, out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and rightdoing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. When the soul lies down in that grass, the world is too full to talk about. Mm -hmm. I'll read that again. Mm -hmm. Out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and rightdoing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. When the soul lies down in that grass, the world is too full to talk about. Thank you again. Thank you.